Hello, Seekers. Um, again, here with uh, Dr. Nisha and Mark from the Path of Zen. And today we have a special topic, which, well, at least I find it special, is the Buddha relics go to Kenya, Nairobi, uh, to be exact, which I think is really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nisha was involved with that. And I'm really interested to hear about the experience and what happened and uh, this is quite rare in my eyes. You don't hear of this, the the Buddha relics going to um, Africa. You hear it traveling around Southeast Asia and some Western countries, but various. I've never heard of the Buddha relics visiting, you know, a country in Africa. So I thought for you, the viewer, I thought this would be, this is interesting, and that's why I invited uh, Dr. Nisha and Mark uh, on my channel to talk about this uh, experience. Yes, thank you. Good morning to you, Bante, in Thailand, 9 a.m. there. Hello, Mark. It's a good evening to you both from California. Yes, it was the most incredible, memorable, unforgettable time in Nairobi. I am from Kenya. I was born and raised in Africa. And um, my long journey in life has taken me, my education, all the way to Minnesota, which is where I, I learned about the relics and viewed them for the first time in Guto. And, and I've shared in the first session that I am Hindu. I do not know about relics. It was just so um, interesting. To me, it was um, like an exhibition of Buddha's artifacts, okay? And it was free, I could not believe it. And so I go to Guto on a Sunday afternoon and honestly it shifted my whole inner being. I was never the same again. And I shifted in a way that the consciousness takes a leap. There's a kind of understanding that really settled in me that you can look at education and you can look at love. And you can look at loving kindness and you can look at these objects that are still here 2,600 years later that somehow hold the essence of the historical Buddha. This was just too much because I felt I was in the presence of Buddha. Okay, I was in the presence of Buddha when you look at the relics. Now, the experience for my family to host the relics was so tremendous. 3,000 plus people came to our home in Los Angeles and we petitioned to the Maitreya project, we'd like to take the relics to Nairobi. I mean, this was a, this, this was big, okay? And you're massive. right, this is massive. massive, it is massive. But when you have had that shift and you see now, my family also Hindu, they, they were saying, well, what are we doing here? But my brother and I were very, very intentional about the Los Angeles tour. And then when my family hosted it and we saw, we saw people heal. We saw people be lifted out of their physical misery, out of their emotional misery. And so they come in through the living room into the Buddha field with a face and they left with the original face. What do I mean by that? I mean that there was a kind of compassion and a light in their eyes. The forehead is serene and the eyes are quiet, you know, if I can say it like that. So when we petitioned um, Maitreya Project for Nairobi, in fact, you know, obviously it's never been to Kenya, Nairobi, is it safe? I'll tell you, these questions immediately came up. And we said, our intention holds. We are responsible. We put our hand up to do the work. All right? May, may, may I ask a question here? Is what religion or what practice is commonplace uh, in that part of the world? Kenya. Kenya is quite diverse, but it's primarily Catholic, Christian. Oh. And Catholic. Muslim. Mo yes, yes, lots of missionaries. And uh, Muslim, because we had lots of uh, trade with Saudi Arabia, the Arabian countries in the peninsula, coming down yeah. to the coast of Kenya. Swahili is an Arabic language, right? So, what? Oh, yes. 
Swahili, ha, jambo, buona, bante, is Swahili, hello, bante. So, that's, Kenya, that's Arabic, it's not, it's oh, not yes, African? Oh, yes, it's an offshoot of Arabic language. Oh, yes. Wow, Swahili. okay. The Swahili peoples. Did you know that, Mark? <laughs> no, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, so you're looking at Christian, right. you're looking at Muslim, and, of course, you have a quite a diaspora of uh, the Indian faith. So Hindu, Hinduism. Okay. Well, that gives us that gives us a bit of more of a context of yes. where you bring in the Buddha relics too. Yeah, yeah. And so here we are, and the Buddha relics came to Nairobi. And in fact, I have the original poster here of the Maitreya project, and it says, "Exhibition of sacred relics of Buddha and Buddhist masters." Um, 8, 9, and 10, July 2011, almost to the day after they came to our home in uh, Los Angeles. This was held at the Sanatan Dharma Temple. Sanatan Dharma is, it's like a, um, it doesn't have a deity as such, okay? It is, um, I, I wouldn't say it's unity church, but it's, it's analogous to that, okay? So the, exhibition the actual tour was hosted in the Sanatan Dharma temple and I have a few slides to share with you to give you a sense of the magnificence the di the diversity of people that came and as I show you I'll take you through the opening ceremony and my goodness the lines of people some waited three hours plus to get so into did you the uh, sorry, did you did you um, contact the uh, abbot of the temple there? Did you know him beforehand, or how no. did that work? How, how did you organize to bring the relics there? Well, uh, my family lives in Nairobi, and right. the Sanatan Dharma is a temple which they go for Diwali, the Diwali oh. Hindu celebration. So the head okay. priest knew, and I'll tell you this. He was quite reluctant, says, you know, we don't be, bring dead things into temple. And so my family had to explain that this is this is not a dead thing. This is the relic. This is the essence of Buddha masters. And he agreed. And I think, again, you know, you cannot think about this intellectually or through a religious lens. You have to shift your mindset. And I think, I think, I think he was saying that in order just i don't think he was being negative because uh i think he was just kind of uh in that sense i can see why he said that that wasn't it that could sound negative but it wasn't he's mm -hmm. just reminding he's just reminding you and like a, a monk that you know that's a relic you know that the, the 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 wisdom is inside you that's more important that's more what i get out of what he meant by yes. that Yes, yes. Yeah, and he's just uh, trying to alert you, don't, you know, like, don't get, you know, don't get attached to relics, you know, it's you still, you have to find it within yourself. So I think I understand why he would say something like that. And yes. and, and and it's evident that he accepted it, obviously. Which oh, monk did, wouldn't, yeah. which monk wouldn't accept Buddha relics coming to visit his own temple? <laughs> <I don't laughs> <think so. laughs> yeah, and, uh, and the, you know, the, uh, the leader of the Buddhist temple in Nairobi is Bhante Vimala. He's a Theraveda tradition as you are. And he was like, oh, wow, what do you mean the relics are coming? How did you manage this? And so he opened uh, the ceremony in Nairobi. I'll, I'll screen share and show you. Sure, sure. Do you want to get in here quickly, Mark, before this? Why, why oh, no, I want to, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So on the left here, you see, uh, this is Shakyamuni relic stupas. And so, and this is the altar um, of the, in the Sanatan Dharma temple. So there was a poster, you can see the Maitreya statue and the baby Buddha, which Everybody washes the baby Buddha with saffron water. And as you do, you are purifying yourself. This is the whole objective. As you go in, you wash the baby Buddha and you hold your heart's wishes. For the baby Buddha is us. 
our child, our own heart's desires. So this is the relic, um, stupa. Wow. I mean, the the whole altar there. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? It's quite. It's... It is. It is quite magnificent. Yes, and the way the lights were arranged. Again, my brother, who's just come from Nairobi, he he arranged all this and the flowers, and it was quite lovely, really. And uh, this was the opening night. The gentleman you see here in the suit and tie is Right Honorable Joe Nyaga. And he's the Minister of Cooperative Development in Kenya at that time. And he was the guest of honor. He was so moved. I mean, his opening ceremony, he was visibly like, this is unity. This is, I feel something here quite unique. And next to him in the pink uh, dress is the uh, High Commissioner uh, of Uganda to Kenya. And next to her, in this gentleman in the Indian outfit is the chair of the Hindu Council of Kenya. Um, yeah, uh, uh, his name is uh, Vanraj Sarveya. Sarveya, yes. Mm, and here is Venerable uh, Bante Vimala. The, oh, look, at, look at the smile on his face <laughs> oh oh yes it was it was it was marvelous it was Have a look marvelous. at that smile look, look at that smile it's like yes. wow look at this. He, he's he's blown away he's so happy he's blown yeah. away yeah yeah and this is uh uh of course honorable joe Nyaga. this is the um shakyamuni case with rahula and Kasyapa Buddha. Okay, Kasyapa is the Buddha be before um, yeah. Buddha. How 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 that how they were able to, um, uh, I guess, uh, preserve. Verify. Yeah. Oh, they preserved this. Now yeah, but how? You know how long ago that was. You know how long Buddha Kasyapa but was. But you see, it is a lineage that's unbroken. I know, but that's what makes this so. That's what makes this so like really hard to comprehend because. Buddha Kasapa, Maha Buddha Kasapa, yes, was how long ago? Like, we're talking a really long time ago. Yes, I don't yes. even I don't even know, but it's not it's not five thousand years. It's much longer than that. Much longer than that. Yes, that is true. And they don't put a date. It is so it's proximate. But he is the Buddha before Shakyamuni, and then wow. on in this case is Rahula, of course, a Buddha's son who also yeah. became a monk. And so you can see it was so beautiful because you could spend as much time as you want with the Buddha masters. And so many people came and look at them. They're just like, my God, you know, they'd buy rosaries and cards and anything just to hold on to this, this feeling, this feeling of tremendous love that just the Buddha feel coming into the temple. And you can see the picture here of Shakyamuni, Kasyapa Buddha, and Rahula is, is sort of tucked away in the back there. These are the stupas. That, that, the that, sorry, on the left there, that's a photo of Kasyapa Buddha, is it? Yes, it is an artist, of course. Of um, course, of course. Yeah. That'd be interesting to see. if you Do, do you have like an actual <clears throat> slide of that, for example? That I would could, be interesting. I could look into it for you. Yes. Oh, that would be great. That would yes. be. I'd love to see that. I've never seen. Okay. I've never seen that one. So that okay. would be good. Yes. And this is, of course, the first Buddhist council. You have Modgalyana, Ananda, Sariputra. When, when I saw this case in Minneapolis, I mean, I fell to my knees because I had read about these masters, but to actually see these and 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 and, and something just just coming out and it was like a hug. I, I I can't explain it any other way. I was, as you said, blown away. These are all yeah, well, this is, just just seeing just seeing the the slides is blowing me away. Just mm -hmm. seeing the slides. Can you imagine what the what actually being there would have been like? It was magnificent. And you can see oh, the wow. the lines of people three hours. It goes right out the door, around, and they were so patient. They would wait well, there. And, and this is and this is pr primarily, uh, like like you said, Catholic, Muslim. Uh, obviously, there's Hindu there. Yes. Um, 
and 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 I guess the tribal religions, the 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 local native religion or whatever it is. Masai, you're right, Kikuyu, they were all there. This oh, is wow. just one example of a picture, uh, and for you know, uh, to for brevity, I choose one, I put it there. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. But this was really um, mind blowing. Okay, I'll just stop the share here. Um, I'll tell you, you know, the, here, here's an example of what, what happened. Um, this person was driving on the other side of Nairobi. He's not Hindu, nothing to do with Sanatam Dharma temple. He's just driving. And for some reason, he said it was almost like a strong desire to come to Sanatam Dharma temple, Lower Kabete Road. I met him. I said, well, he was so wide-eyed, so shaken up. And I said, are you okay? Do you want a glass of water? He says, no, no, this is a miracle. And I said, what brings you here? He says, well, I didn't know about this tour. I didn't know. I didn't see any posters, nothing. I'm just driving along. He canceled all his meetings and he drove to Lower Kabete to the temple and he spent many hours his life shifted. There were other people who would go around the altar table very slowly, intentionally. And one said, she was looking like this and, 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 and literally went on her knees. And I said, are you okay? Because you want to be sure that people are fine. Do they need help to get back on a chair? Because there were some, you know, very unusual things going on. And she said, <laughs> that, 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 and she's going like this. I said, that, that, what is talking to you? I came, I didn't even hold the question, but it has been like a question, a, a weight on my mind. And it came up and, and she points like this, not like that. She pointed like this and said, Marpa, Marpa gives me an answer. I know what to do. And she started to cry. And she mm. just sat there again for a long, long time. Again, the original face comes. There's not one of, oh, you know, what is this life? What is this life? But one of, oh, I'm connected with the masters. They're here. They're assisting me. You, you don't have to be a Buddhist faith. They're right here, immediate. And an answer. Well, because, 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 because mind is mind. It, it's not, a mind is not Buddhist, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's like the Buddha. The, the Buddha said it himself. It's like I didn't, I didn't create Dharma. The Buddha says, you know, I didn't create the four noble truth. I realized them. I saw them. I saw Dharma. You know, like yes. I realized the four noble truth. So it Dharma is a thing on on itself, onto itself. It's not. It's it's not a cr really created by anybody. Nobody owns it. And yes. the mind. And the mind is the mind. Right. You know, the, and the I, you make a mind. beautiful point, you know, Bante, because this is untouched by human intellect, untouched by human hand. And you can't, you know, you you say thank you. You thank you, you know, for because the pathway became clear. Life became, you know, you can see people just <sighs> Okay, I was doing because there was a shift. All the outer conditions can be, but you have shifted, and you're right. It is untouched by therapists and science, and untouched by human hands and intellect constructs. So, there was another one that I would like to share, please. And yes. please forgive me. I'm going to read from uh, because no, it was no, a no, news, no. newspaper article. There's plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. You you can actually take your time and relax. Because we don't. We're not in a rush. So. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So um. So this is a um. Journalist. Her name is Ruhila Adatya, and it was during the time of the relics, and and in fact, she said to the editor, "I want this published." You know. And she is Muslim, uh, and she says, I've never, you know, dabbled, she used the word dabbled in Buddhism, and that, you know, this is as foreign as anything, 
But she said, my friend Kunjin had visited the relics in, in the temple and he wouldn't stop raving about it. So whatever her friend went through, he's telling uh, Ruhila, please come with me. So I begged him to accompany me because it was too daunting. I couldn't believe that these uh, objects of Buddha were in Nairobi. I couldn't believe it. So Kunjin explained that there was a reason. There was a reason that Ruhila, you are going. And I looked at him like he was barking mad. Okay, so she comes and she says, it is the single decision in my life. I will forever cherish. Okay. And she goes on to explain what are these relics? She says the Tibetan call these ring cell. Ring cell. That's true. This is the more official term rather than relics. But the ring cell are special. And, and what and what's and what like if you were to translate ring cell into English, what would that mean? Those are the relics. Those are the objects that we're seeing, the pearl-like um uh, no, no, no. I know, I know the relics, but would what if you were to do equate an English translation? Would it be more like uh, holy objects? I would or say would they're be... imprinted objects with the intention of the Buddha okay. Master. They hold the qualities, as you said, the four noble truths are held. The more you hold them, and, and the more you realize the self-realize of the Buddha qualities. The ring cell are there and they are different colors and they expand and they will manifest those truths in you. I think this is it. This is like a, a tool, a vehicle for us to remember. Okay. So uh, the she goes on to write, this journalist. Well, that's so, interesting what you just said there. Yes. A tool to remember. Mm -hmm. See, that's what's really interesting. And that's why temples why? are important. That's why temples are important, yes. why why holy places are important. And the Buddha talked about that as well. That's um, why pilgrimages great... are necessary. Yes. Yeah. Because well, if temples you... hold the seed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, but the remembering, it's a, it like they remind you. You know, these, like Buddha was talking about stupas, right? The stupa, especially if, if you, uh, if an arahant passes away, the Buddhist community has to, has to, there's no choice, has to build a stupa for that arahant, right? And the Buddha said, the reason is, is because for generations to come, it will remind people that this, they, what, there, there is such a thing. It's mm -hmm. like a, a mem it's like a memory. So it's not just about us remembering, it's also about, future generations remembering as well yes. and remembering what remembering what it's not so much that you're remembering the just the buddha and the arahants not so much that but mm -hmm. remembering in that there's there is something else you know that yes. this, this something beyond you, you know you're 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 making this so wonderful bante because it wasn't the form of buddha because there is no body there it is a quality that somehow these ring cell have. And you know, um, the spiritual teachers do not discuss their own attainments. They don't even say anything, but these ring cell, mm -hmm, yeah. right. And these are physical evidence that the Buddha masters had reached a kind of mastery. And it, it, in, in that sense, it is a, 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 a wonderful protocol, you know, in Lam Rim, you, you do a practice and you'll have certain dreams, you'll have certain realizations, you'll have changes even in your physical form. And in that way, I think of it like a science protocol, that you have this and this, and then you'll have this, you know. Um, maybe it's a poor analogy, but, you know, as a scientist, I think, well, there is a unity in spirit and in the scientific protocols because we are the complementary ways of knowledge, yes. So, so here's what she goes on to say, Ruhila. The relics provided a unique opportunity to make spiritual connection with enlightened beings. This is her words. She's Muslim. These masters deliberately chose to leave these relics behind so we can create the causes 
for our own happiness. Isn't that interesting? So they're helping us create the conditions for our own lightness, for our own heart's wishes, for our own understanding that this is the whole. This is it. That's a very and just deeply by being, insightful. Mm -hmm. And she was. I mean, she's writing this. And, and just by being in their presence, you feel healed, inspired, and at peace. And so, you know, and at the end, she says it was truly soul shifting, moving. And although I'm Buddhist, I mean, I'm Muslim, my spirituality grew more varied, more deeper. And that is so beautiful because she didn't deny anything. She was at first hesitant, but her friend Kunjan says, no, come, come. You have to see this raving right like admiring and uh it starts like that just like my friend in edmonton nisha please they're in minneapolis you must go and i thought relic but it was the soul in me responding that you have to go and i think the buddha masters were calling me that just like the driver an irresistible yeah, urge there's a few thoughts about that Mark, please chime in when you when you <laughs> when you feel <laughs> hey, you need a rescue. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just you know you haven't said much, <laughs> you know. You know uh, oh, you I'm just enjoying that. hearing this amazing story. Um, oh, the okay. relics. I mean, there, there's really nothing like the relics in any of the other traditions. Um, you know, there's no Christian relics. Like, there's no nothing like this at all. And it really just to see to have something like the Buddhist relics or the Buddha relics um, that we can go see, and there they are. Um, it really just brings faith right out, right to mind. Mm -hmm. And that's something, like I said, we don't have that with with the other religions. You don't have that in Christianity. You have religious objects from various patriarchs or popes or theologians. And the same thing with the within the Islamic traditions. You have a few remnants of mm -hmm. from various um, excuse me from various um, theologians and uh, famous um, figures, but you don't. But you have nothing like this, and. No. The the just bringing faith the, the 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 mind of faith right out, and that's very powerful. Um, I mean, you drop right to your knees uh, level of um, of of bringing that out and fully encountering your own your own faith. Yeah, it's like coming home. Yeah, it is coming home. I want to share one more story and this I, I would urge your um, followers to get the power of holy relics to change minds and bring peace and this is a book that was commissioned by Lama Zopa Rinpoche the spiritual director and he just passed away a few weeks ago but uh, in Nairobi uh, I think it was the second or third day uh, Venerable Paula Chichester she's from um, um, you know she was one of the custodians in Nairobi who came with the relics on the plane and you know we greeted at the Nairobi airport and so on and we were packing up for the night and one of the Buddha masters Geshe Konchok Geshe Lama Konchok Geshe is of course the Tibetan word for teacher Geshe La which is Geshe Lama Konchok he had perfected all Buddha attributes. He used to, I think, reside in Kopan, Nepal. His relics are part of the tool. He's this diminutive monk that when he was cremated, 90 pounds and 160 pounds of relics were collected. Imagine. They're all over Kopan. So there is a bone relic, uh, and his relics are part of the tool. 
So on this evening, Paula and we are, you know, closing up. I turned off the lights. Paula's writing in the book. I turned off the lights in the room and there was a bright light in the case. We all saw it. It's true. Because I swear I was there. I went, oh my God, is there a light? One of the lamps or what is this? It was Geshela. The relic was glowing. Oh. I took it out of the case and blessed everyone on the head. I'm getting goosebumps because I, I rushed there. I said, put it on my crown chakra. I was very greedy, okay? I got I to get in here first <laughs> to, because I, I've got a lot of people that are probably watching that, look, you've got to go check it out. Like uh, it's something, it's, for example, I'll give you the story between Buddha and Mahamogalana. Mahamogalana, Venerable Mahamogalana was walking. I think he was coming back from arms round or something. And Venerable Mahamogalana was known because for supernatural powers above, you know, amongst the other things, right? But also very wise. And uh, Venerable Mahamogalana saw something, right? He saw something beyond the human eye. And he, but he didn't say anything. And he just had a big smile on his face, like a smile. Or, and a lay person happened to see him in that, at that moment. And he asked, Venerable Mahab, Mahab Mogalana, you know, why are you smiling? What have you seen? And he said, oh, you can ask the Buddha. He says, no, 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 you tell me no. He says, no, 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 you can come and ask <clears throat> Lord Buddha. So later on that day, uh, <clears throat> the lay person came and, and, and asked the Buddha, you know, paid respect and all the usual. And the Buddha said, ah, oh, Mahab Mogalana saw something and he didn't say anything but I can confirm that he saw it. And, <laughs> and then the, the, Buddha, the Buddha goes on, on a talk about when we talk about supernatural things, usually people out there think you know, that it's not happening or that it's not real or that we're crazy, right? But the problem in our society is because it's, we, there's very little spiritual, uh, well, probably that's not fair, but I would say, I would say not many people meditate so 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 that would have a level of concentration a daily level of concentration to that exceeds six seven hours of sitting practice not many people have that in yeah. the western world mm -hmm. so <clears throat> they're un they're unable to uh, perceive that such things exist mm -hmm. right because you're talking about a mind that's not developed yes okay so we need to, that's why, it's not because we're afraid. It's not because we're crazy. It's just it's hard to talk about an experience to somebody else that has not experienced it. That's why uh, I have a saying, experience cannot be translated. Yes. Right? So you're, you're okay. You're, you're, a, you're safe with me. But um, I'm also saying this to people watching this and confirming that what Dr. Nisha has seen I've seen that things like this um, in these situations where people start doing all kinds of things. I can't speak on where the relics shine. That's just a, a no-go zone for a monk. I can't talk about those kind of things. Yes. Uh, because the Buddha, the Buddha made it very clear that monks cannot talk about these kind of things for this reason. Right. For this reason. Right. You know, right. because a monk uh, or someone who's, or a summoner, right, a holy person, someone who's, uh, practicing okay it's not just monks it's anybody like a rishi uh, or anyone who's practicing a summoner someone in, or a sekia someone mm -hmm. in practice where they're practicing day and night day and night day and night and they're really pushing themselves to the limit which drives drives you crazy sometimes because you're going beyond beyond you're mm -hmm. breaking all your mm -hmm. limitations you know you're eating little food you're drinking little water you're dealing with harsh conditions and you're pushing yourself to the extreme. Some mm -hmm. people go crazy for a while because you're going beyond you, you, you're going beyond that normal conditioning, and that sometimes is can can drive you crazy. And when I say crazy, I say it in a healthy way, in the sense that you turn around and it's like a, it's like this, okay? It's it's like say for example you grew up in a family, and you're thinking that your mother and father is your mother and father. Your brothers are your brothers. 
And then one day after 20 or 30 years, say 30 years, you find out you're adopted. You actually mm -hmm. find out the truth that they're actually not your know, mother and father, not real, right? So that would create a certain psychological uh, uh, experience in you, whether negative, positive, but it would certainly really, really get into your the, the electrodes that connect to your brain and your nervous system mm -hmm. cause a lot of kerfuffle, cause a lot of uh, the wires to be like, what the hell? This does not compute. This does not compute. You know, so your reality is totally changed. It's changing and you're seeing a, a totally different reality to what you're accustomed to. And that can cause some people to start yelling and screaming at in, in yelling and screaming. It can cause people to faint. It can cause people to get a temperature and get ill. It can cause people to just be out there for quite some time. Right. So this is the logic behind it. So when you see something like the relics, which is so powerful, like what people don't understand in general is the Buddha had developed all the parami. Yes. And, and, and to understand that is difficult in itself, even for me, what that means. But what I do know, having practiced for a while, that that's a lot. It's massive. It's so massive yes. that it's incomprehensible. It's It yes. just defies the mind. So mm -hmm. that's why people who see the relics for the first time Many things happen, right? So when you go to these kind of events, mm -hmm. you see people uh, having these kind of neurological uh, uh, feedback mechanisms. I call it like on a scientific level, I call it like a neurological storm almost mm -hmm. because the reality is so changed. They've never encountered such uh, compassion or goodwill. Um, you know, for, and the relics of what the relics of the Buddha and the Masters emanate or the power of such a place uh, like yes. where the Buddha is heightened and things like this, mm -hmm. it causes neurological storms in some people and it causes yes. these reactions. You, you you're know? right, you know, I did observe that um, at least in Los Angeles that there would be people who would come to the front door and they couldn't, they couldn't come in. They had to go out and stagger back. And I remember one person went back to a car and cried for a whole day. She actually slept in her car. We realized that we said, come in, have breakfast, have a shower. And then she could come into the Buddha field. But here's what I've also seen Bhante. When people begin serious meditation, the Siddhi powers will be awakened, but that is not the reason it's a gift, but you walk right through them. That right. is not the reason. Some people want to, I don't know, float and levitate and forget all that. You want to love God for the God itself, for just God itself, not for the gifts, not for the gifts. And I think it's a very good point you're making that um, these things will come. They will come about, but don't get stuck in that. And I have an example, actually, one of my patients, she's very spiritual. She's actually a, a doctor herself. And she, we, we would have these conversations and she went very seriously into meditation. And one day called me seriously, like, I need to talk to you. I thought she was having a problem with her health, as in her arthritis. And I call her and I said, are you all right? And, uh, you know, she says, I can hear people's thought as clear as they're speaking to me. I become clairvoyant and I know exactly what's going to happen, you know, two or three days henceforth. And she got, she says, I don't, I don't want this. It's, she had, uh, she had awakened these powers. And <laughs> do you, do you see, she was so disturbed. She says, I know what everybody's thinking. I can tell, and it is not good, Nisha. I said, she calls me Dr. Manek, but I said, okay, you have to pray over this and shut up because it became awakened in her so fast. So we have to tell people these things will possibly come about and not to be disturbed. Like I told how, how you. Many I, people, uh, how many people wish to be clairvoyant? And I, like, I get that a lot. Like mm -hmm. one of the, like I would say, one of the top questions or the top topics uh, all time topics is this whole thing about supernatural powers. 
Um, and, you know, one is like reading minds, um, you know, the ability to forecast future events, all this kind of stuff. And I said, and, and, and I say, be careful what you wish for. And, and the Buddha <laughs> talks about this. The, yeah. the Buddha talks about this frantically. And, and the seniors in my tradition just say, <laughs> go for the, the highest supernatural power there is, or as far as I know, and as far as I've studied, and as far as my knowledge takes me today, is wisdom. Because even in the, in the text, wisdom is the, the, the sixth abhinya or the sixth abiding or the sixth kind of like knowledge, the highest knowledge where final knowledge comes is mm. wisdom. So wisdom is above all the supernatural stuff. Yes. Um, and if you're a clairvoyant and you yourself have not got a stable foundation um, or a stable level of concentration and you're not able to keep your feet on the ground um, and you float off into this. So that's another thing. People float when they meditate instead of being grounded. And that's dangerous because you can – get caught by uh, dark forces in that situation. Yes. Yeah, I was go actually going to gonna say something about that, um, exactly what you were talking about, because within the, the Zen um, teachings, they will talk about that various things, like the supernatural powers can happen. And this is something that... <clears throat> Uh, meditators or people who go deeply into their own minds can bring about without a teacher, without somebody that can guide you and help you and stabilize you. The, the chances of slipping into madness happens and the chances of bringing in something very dark is true. And I actually remember um, that happened to a young and the Zen Center priest actually performed an exorcism because it was dark mm -hmm. of what ha what she brought back with her. So and that's the that is the unspoken. It's it's very it's not spoken about very much within the Zen communities anymore. Um, most people just say, "Oh, just sit, meditate, and everything will be great, and groovy, and happy," and you know, mm -hmm. then we'll go drink tea. But yet when people start having problems and, and it's like, hey, look, I'm meditating and I'm, and I'm actually ending up in a different position or in a different part of the room or I'm hearing everybody else's thoughts because I'm thinking everybody's talking and they're not or I'm talking about things that haven't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And people say things like this and then. The, the 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 Zen centers don't know how to handle it. They they they're like, oh, ooh, what's this? And this has sort of been the the, the issue with um, untrained people teaching meditation and untrained mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. handling this. And oftentimes it ends up with people like our you know Dr. Nisha. <laughs> so she has to, she's getting the phone call. Dr. Nisha, help me. You're a doctor. I'm going crazy. Mm. You know, and, and you 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 bring to mind a very um it's it's a it's a really interesting little story about Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti. You know, he used to give lectures, lots of people, and he comes onto the stage, pin drop silence. He sits on his chair. Okay, he just sits quietly, pin drop silence. He gets up and walks off wordlessly and later on somebody said Krishnamurti you know all these people are waiting to hear you talk he says the air the very air was thick with thoughts I can see it all but they don't want to listen to me so do you see so we think that we our thoughts and our things are private they're not yeah. they're oh not. they're not they're not at all they're not at all in fact in fact, right, if one thing you need to be very careful of is someone is someone who has got good samadhi, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I have to be careful how I, I've got to toe the line here. So, for example, this is why people used to also fear going to see the Buddha. <laughs> and that's why, you know, that's why some, some monks – so I'm going to talk about others, not myself, okay? Some monks fear going to see certain senior monks who are very 
staunch meditation practitioners. And there's a strong story of this, like Ajahn Man, who's a legend in and, and one of the great seniors of the, the Thai tradition. People used to shake in fear when they used mm-hmm. to go see him because he, you know, he could do he could sit for, you know, 30 hours straight, seven days straight, no problem. That's how staunch his concentration power was. So yeah, you're and, and what, when you when you're in the Buddhist community, you start to see things from people uh, who have got different virtues and who have developed different disciplines. It's quite an amazing things to see and experience. When yes. you're in this circle of people, everything makes sense. There's no there's no such thing as crazy, right? Because there's different stages of concentration which bring out different virtues or different developments. Yes. And this is what we talk about: parami, uh, perfections. Yes. Perfections, right? Which is not really embedded in Western culture. It's not really talked about in best. Well, I mean, we talk about virtues like being honest and being hardworking and stuff, but nothing a lot, nothing is what we're talking about right here. You know? Right, right, right. I, I, I think I also, Mark, I agree with you with one thing and, and Bante is to have a teacher. Oh, yeah. I, I think, you know, um, I, I have warned uh, some of my friends, do not take a weekend workshop to raise your kundalini. Don't do things like that because it's dangerous. You haven't even anchored yourself. Your nervous system is not primed. And now you're doing exercises in breath work. You paid thousands of dollars to raise your kundalini. I mean, these are workshops. We have to be careful. We must tell people that you can get a psychotic break. And I, I think this is what Bhante is saying, that you're going to have oh, neural... You can. Yeah, yeah, you can get a yeah, psychotic you can. break. <laughs> like I can tell you, we've had experience... When I lived at the Zen Center, we would have experiences of people who had gone to these Kundalini retreats. Three, four, or five days later, they're having, they're having huge waves of energy and thoughts coming to them. And we ask them, what happened? What happened? And they say, well, five days ago, with this Kundalini retreat, went home, thought everything was fine, went back to work. And all of a sudden, now this is happening. Yeah. And we're like, can you, you know, we're, and so I'm on the phone, like trying to call these, these, these people up saying, uh, what's going on here? T- tell us about this retreat that this person was on. Yeah. And they're telling us, oh, that's, that's, we don't know who this person is. This person just came to the retreat. And, and, and so then our, our, it was up to us to kind of, you know, kind of mold that down into something that was manageable for that person, right. but it happened, it happened more than once. Yeah. So, so it's, it's uh, painted as though it's an answer to life's problems and it's not, we all have our works to do. We all have our choices every day. And uh, uh, please don't go to Kundalini workshops, is my advice, you know. Find a good teacher. And yeah, in I my life, Kundalini. this karma has been good for me to have to have the relics. It was obvious now, you know, and uh, to be granted permission and to be with the Buddha masters. Honestly, it shifted me. I mean, it, it catapulted me out of academics, you know. Thank God. Because I was in the head, intellect all the time, you know. I still do yeah. it, but uh, but there is a kind of honesty now, as an honesty. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, you know, what we're going to do in our next video, in our next presentation, is we're going to start getting into this science, um, this science between science and spirituality. This is going to be a tough one, an interesting bone to chew. Uh, you've got, you, you'll have we'll, a Zen we'll teacher. chew it. We'll chew it, Bante. You'll have a Zen teacher. You'll have a a, 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 a simple monk and a doctor trying to trying to bridge this gap together. And I know, Doctor Nishi, you've written a whole book on this, which is what was it called again? It was called Bridging, Bridging Science and Spirit. Okay, so you can get that book if you're interested. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about more about that book as we go on. But what's really interesting about all of this is that, uh, and you know. To, to kind of bring today to, to a conclusion um, is that you see the, the sometimes the development, uh, it's hard to, you know, there's a thing called Sama Samadhi, 
right? Mm -hmm. Which means mm -hmm. sama in Pali means uh, correct or the right way, samadhi concentration. At the same time, there's, there's a thing called micha samadhi. Micha meaning Pali wrong, incorrect, mm -hmm. don't go down that way. Mm -hmm. And this is what I want to kind of uh, end on this, that there is a right and wrong way to do everything, particularly in spirituality. For example, um, there's a lot of spiritualists who believe you should be smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. Like you see the sadhus in it. Do you see the sadhus in India yeah. smoking mm -hmm. marijuana and or uh, hashish or um, or people taking mushrooms and stuff like that. Now, I was a herbalist before, so I tried a lot of crazy stuff. I went down that whole um, like uh, uh, stimulant path for a while just out of interest. Okay. What that does, it, 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 it connects to your nervous system and it gives you a, such a, an intense rush for a few hours, but then it just drops and leaves you to, for dead and you become addicted to that. But the problem with that is the physical after the, the physical after effects that can be quite damaging long term yes. that people don't talk mm. about, like even ayahuasca, marijuana, right, uh, right, mushrooms, psilocybin, <laughs> cocaine, you know, or cocaine leaf. It's natural. Yes, all these things are natural. Sure, sure, sure. But you have to understand the process. What it does, it takes you to a high level very quick, and then it drops you, mm -hmm. right, and that that is not good for your brain nor for good for your nervous system right i don't think well, it's, it's good for your karmic yeah. development i no. think it leaves you in a karmic debt so I forget the say, physical and yeah. that when when my teacher told me that on you know he's discussing these things um, and even vimala tucker she has said please be careful Kundalini is one, and also these uh, these LSD and di these types of drugs, karmic debt. When she when they said that, that's it, because we are here to go into with a consciousness. This is not the way to do it. No, it exactly. It's, it's, it's quite it's quite artificial when you look mm -hmm. at it. Like it's it's a quick it's a it's it's like a quick gratification, it's like alcohol. Know, self medicating, it's a quick gratification, but yeah. then you get dropped. You get really I was gonna, dropped. yeah, I want to add that my, my, I guess, my Dharma grandmother, um, G.U. Kennett, she wrote that these drugs are, are is like enlightenment through a funhouse mirror. You get a really distorted view of things, and it, it can leave a scar. It can leave a spiritual scar. And she she met quite a few people back in the... She was um, teaching at Shasta, first in San Francisco, and then Shasta Abbey around the uh, 60s and 70s when that whole, you know, um, you know drop in, drop out culture was, was happening. And she would counsel people that were doing lots of drugs. And she kind of, you know, said that all of them were having these funhouse mirror, uh, funhouse mirror versions of enlightenment, but they were coming out very scarred, but we've spiritually scarred, and um, almost to the point where their 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 psyches were warped as the funhouse mirror. <laughs> well, the to to undo the damage, how many lifetimes, eons and thousands, you know? Wow, yeah, wow. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, having having gone down that path before, I tell you one one, I can tell talk about one experience because it's not really talking about supernatural uh, experience. It's just talking about. So, one of the things I've learned um, was that. It's wisdom is hard earned. And any and, and, and one thing that I think is a universal you could say universally is anything that's good is hard earned. Anything that's substantial is hard earned. Not, nothing good comes easy to anybody. It's like when you plant um, a seed of mango, sometimes it may take 20 years before that thing turns into a tree and actually uh, creates fruit, right? Yes. That's the reality of a mango seed, okay? It's not quick, and practice is no different. 
And although the Buddha enlightened in six years, right, supposedly, right, but the background story of the Buddha and what the Buddha did in those six years, mm -hmm. right, um, man, you're talking about not eating for six months. You're talking about sacrificing and sitting for months and months on end and not getting up to walk. You're talking about going to so many different extremes and then finally he found, he found his middle way. He found mm -hmm. that, that place, right? Yes. Now, and, and, and so people think, oh, you know, you find this middle place. It's easy, not too hard, not so I can do all these other things. No, 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 no. You have to find, it's a struggle to find that middle place. That's what people are missing. You have to struggle for, for most of us, not all of us. Uh, we have to struggle to find that middle place. And if the practitioner is not struggling in this life, that means before that that practitioner has done something but if the lord buddha had to struggle what about us us yes yes what about us so before that middle before you engage into that middle section or that middle path or where you find that i don't know that sent that centralization where the mind releases right it no longer clings and no longer grips to anything mm -hmm. no longer even no longer craves and clings to the body it's understood the truth as it is and it just releases completely, right? To get to that point, to get to that point, it's a struggle. It's a massive struggle, and there's no shortcuts to it. Yeah. And that's that's the one lesson I've learned. Uh, that's what I learned from all this other stuff. Because when I was going through that that experimental phase, mm -hmm. by trying all different stimulants, right, and then later, but but, but my scientific brain was still at work mm -hmm. because I would study it. And I would study the, the elation, but then the next day and for the next few days, I would study the depression and yes. also the effects it had on my, uh, on, on, on my urinary system and my bowel system and my eyes and my heart system. I could feel palpitations and weakness. I could feel my urination was getting blocked. I could feel all kinds of things. And also on certain different other stimulants, I would feel this dull kind of uh, heaviness afterwards that couldn't be relieved um in a normal way because i took myself up extremely high very quick yeah and so you get addicted to that and then you fall down really low mm -hmm. you see? So this this is something that's very misunderstood in the spiritual circles now sama samadhi that is something that one has to sit down and develop with hard work over time you see and and, and it's not something you can do. Uh, that's why people get bored with it. That's why people say it doesn't work because you sweat, you go through a lot of pain and you've got to sit for hours and hours and daily and daily and daily. You get their benefits immediately but and, and meditation walking and also keeping the mind in sati awareness where you're totally always absorbed and uh, focused on the object at hand. This is very boring and difficult to do. It's a task. It's a chore. It's yeah. like it's no it's no different from getting a shovel and just shoveling sand. It's really it's really not different to that. It's it's actually not an exciting thing. But what people want is the exciting results immediately. Mm -hmm. And when people and this is a big mistake people make when they come to meditation or shit, particularly temples, especially the forest temples. After a week, they they start they run out of here. Because they just can't handle the discipline, they're not at that level. Right. You know? So, so, so I need to say uh, that samasa concentration, the real stuff that produces the big parami, like I mean, the real stuff, where it takes to the point where the mind, where chitta releases completely from all the bondage. Right? You cannot cheat that. Mm -hmm. You cannot get there through stimulation. You cannot yeah. pretend. You cannot pretend you can't cut corners. You've got to struggle to get to that middle ground. And you have to sweat and go through a lot of pain and anguish and all kinds of emotions and things in order to let go of them. You have to go, you have to go there. You have to go to every corner of your existence and, mm -hmm. and, and cover it for yourself. It's, it's a very deep and profound study of mm -hmm. who you are, of what mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. right? And you're leaving no stone unturned. Whereas when you take any kind of stimulant or you go to some short workshop, right? The workshop <laughs> takes you up. It, it takes you up really, really, really quickly. Right? You think, oh, I'm spiritual really, really quickly. Then then it drops you. 
right? When you leave. <laughs> this is right. a true thing, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, those uh, hyper hyperventilating workshops, you know, we call the cobra breath or the kundalini. Yes, boom, yes. And then boom. <laughs> it's <laughs> Yeah, well, but, we but to, I think but Bante is saying instant gratification is a big problem. It is in the West, and it's something that uh, I think we've everywhere. become addicted to. Oh, I think yeah, everywhere, Mark. I think everywhere. it's the modern world. No, I don't, you know, look, I agree with you that it is the modern world, but the Buddha talks about this, like I'm sure in the Hindu I think teaching, it was. It, in all yeah. ages, we have these human conditions, and they repeat themselves right. and repeat themselves. I mean, you look at the addiction to to you know intimate relations that has never ever uh, <laughs> gone away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <where's> that? <laughs> that has been there from from the, the 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 you know from the beginning of time, as well as pleasures. You know, I think pleasure seeking, because the Buddha talks about this, and so do many other sages. The seeking of pleasure has been an has been a it's a timeless time old thing, where we we want to get that gratification quickly. You know, we we want we don't want to feel the pain on things like this. But if you want to come to spirituality, you better love pain. You better learn to you got to learn to to deal with it. You need to, and it's like Anonka Mahabur says, the 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 pain threshold is something one has to jump over at some point. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to actually let go of it. You have to yes. go to it where it, like he was talking about where he was sitting for six hours straight every day. And he was so adept that he sat once and his hip broke. The hip the one of the hip mm -hmm. bones broke. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful he was. And after the meditation he couldn't walk and he's what's wrong? Goes to the hospital, gets an x ray broken. Wow. Right. This this is the kind of standard we're talking about here. Right. You can't right. Cheat, you can't you can't cheat that. You can't no, cheat that. No. No. And, and what and what Long Term Mahabur was saying was like, someone who sits a lot knows pain very well. Yes. No. Gets to make pain his friend or yes. her friend. Right. Yes. So yes. this is this is the part that people always leave out of spirituality. Yeah. And they try to sell this like feel good stuff. But they don't talk about yeah. how hard it is. It you know, doc, Dr. Hawkins was one of my teachers and he would he, he almost it's a surrender process. So the spontaneity of that present moment, then there's no problem. There's, there's no pain. There's nothing. But there's a there's an exquisite surrender. I, I, I don't know how to describe it because he was more elegant in describing. I went, wow, I, I think I get what he's saying that. Uh, there, there is actually no problems and suffering doesn't need to be, but it's a surrender. It's a surrender. This moment. Th I mean, it's an instant. Okay. So well, the life instant. is spontaneous. It's spontaneous. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, but that, that, that will be tested when you come to periods of pain. Mm -hmm. You will be tested. That's how mm -hmm. you get tested. That's what long time I'll bulk. If you really want to test yourself, Okay, so, um, well, we've been talking for quite some time now. So, <laughs> let, let let me let me let me let, let me say something, and then I'll let you both uh, finish finish off. So, in the the old traditions, particularly, and I know this uh, from ter, ter, uh, Tibetan masters, and uh, from in the Theravada tradition, particularly the old one, it was commonplace that when you first start to meditate. You sit for 12 or 24 hours straight immediately. Immediately. Right? Because it's kind of like you you get into the, you learn, got to learn how to sit. Now, you can do that once. But doing it twice, yeah. three times, four times, 10 times, 20 times, not many people can do that. A lot of people can sit for 10 hours once or twice, but not repeat it, or 10 days but they can't do it repeatedly over the years. That takes something else. That takes yes. a certain discipline. Yes. Right? So that's the thing that gets missed in spirituality. You, you're not going to get anywhere without that discipline. Mm -hmm. You're going to get instant gratification, but you're not going to get development, and you're not going to get the goal, the parami. Now, this thing you're talking about, surrender, it's not that I'm correcting you or anything like that. A lot of people try to sum up things, right? Um, 
but when you're practicing, there's no silver bullet, right? There's it's a combination. That's what makes the Noble Eightfold Path and even Buddha's story even more complex is that it's a bit of this and a bit of that, mm-hmm. a bit of this and a bit of that, and then a bit of this and a bit of that, and then it needs to mature and ripen and come together. You see, it's not just I sit for six hours a day and that's gonna and that I'll be enlightened. That I'd be enlightened by now if that was the case. Right. Honestly, you know, right. um, it's not like, unfortunately, mm-hmm. I still haven't reached my middle. So, you know, there's so many things out there. People are always trying to find that silver bullet. It's got nothing to do with that. What it's got to do with is <clears throat> being in the practice yourself mm-hmm. on, on a daily level and going through the grind. You go mm-hmm. through the grind every day, every day. You work hard every day, right, Dr. Nisha? There's not a silver bullet um logical answer every day it's just hard work every day isn't it Mm -hmm. right if i was to say oh to be a doctor all you need to do is have intelligence no to be a doctor all you need to do is have good knowledge it's not that simple there's a lot of things that are involved in being a doctor and it requires a lot of dedication and, and and so many other things that so many sacrifices that are out of the the normal circle of seeing that it's hard to explain how to be a good doctor is. It means getting up early. It means reading a lot, studying a lot, doing a lot of things you don't want to do. Right. That's the truth. That's the truth, isn't it? Right. It is yeah. the truth. Yes. Yeah. So the truth of spirituality is that you have to do a lot of things in order mm-hmm. to discover yourself um, that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. It means not sleeping. It means not mm-hmm. eating. It mm-hmm. means dealing with bugs. It means dealing with harsh temperatures. <laughs> it means It means, you know, being told off, being, you know, it, so many things here, right? So all I'm saying in this is like uh, going, let, let, let's let conclude now. Um, okay. Going back to your things where you're talking about the relics, people having these out-of-body experiences and stuff. Yes, that's the power of the Buddha. Mm-hmm. That's the power of the Buddha. How many, pe- how many stories in the Buddha teachings where people would just see the Buddha and just faint or just drop oh, to yeah. their knees? Yeah. You know, the actual Buddha. How many people? You know? It's inconceivable. Oh. Just even, I mean, the, 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 the relics, you know. Um, we have a Maitreya statue, and I was thinking next in the science section that I would I would go to my brother's home because we have the stupa and the Maitreya statue as gifts. They were given to my family. You're right. I I, I, I cannot fathom. I, I can't. I can't imagine. I, I can't. Okay. It just stops. Like I can't, um, because right. well, these, you, these you really, really blew, they blow you away. Mm. I, you know. Any last words, Mark, before we close up for today? No. I think that the the Buddha relics are definitely termos, definitely teachers onto themselves. You, you know, you don't. Those are a very different kind of teaching, but I do agree with Dr. Nisha to avoid those weekend kundalini exercises. Don't go to these Vipassana, Golinka uh, retreats. And by all means, get if you're going to meditate and take it seriously, please work with a teacher, somebody that's been there, somebody that's had the experience, somebody that can work with you and wants to work with you. You know, sometimes the people go to these Dharma centers and they think that that's their teacher, but then they find that there's really nobody there to work with or nobody wants to work with them. Mm-hmm. So it's like for me, I took a long time to find my own teachers. I took three years searching. And I would say that for anybody really serious, please, please find a teacher. Yes. Good. 